Well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, whichever part of the world you're in. Welcome to our uh, latest conversation. I'm really uh, excited about this one. We're talking about achieving our goals and uh, getting better and better. And we're very pleased to be having this conversation from the perspective of a double Olympian. Um, I'm going to introduce to, to him in a minute. Um, thank you for joining us. We all, um, we all have this uh, struggle, right? So um, I'm the guy on the left. I'm Dan French. You probably know me. Um, I, I'm founder and CEO of Consider Solutions. But far more importantly today, we've got Daniel Keynes, a double Olympian. He's got more things to his name, more achievements to his name than we've had hot dinners. So welcome, Daniel. Very pleased to have you here with us. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Great to be here. Looking forward to it. So uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Daniel. So Daniel and I met last May, I think, and I heard his story and um, I was fascinated by a combination of focus and determination to achieve a goal and the humility uh, in achieving that. Now, I hope sure Dan's fully blushing, but um, in business, we we often see ourselves and our colleagues not necessarily with enough focus and determination and sometimes with not enough humility so it's nice to have a conversation with somebody who exhibits all of these qualities and before we get into the kind of the olympian athletic story that daniel's going to uh, share with us this is going to be 30 minutes there or thereabouts it's really really to me it's really important for us to think about trying to achieve be the best we can be and recognizing the daily reality. So that little picture on the right is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which I'm sure you all know. This, you know, the, but what it is we all aspire to, and the, the, the ones at the bottom are about basically having safety and shelter and all the rest of it, and then moving up to, you know, love, self-esteem, and that peak is self-actualization, that real kind of zen, you know, flow state almost. And we all aspire to be there, and occasionally we get there. Um, but this kind of, we're, we're all, you know, I'm, I speak to a lot of people, we all are kind of nagged by self-doubt, frustrations, we have probably more struggles and failures than we have successes, we have this imposter syndrome, and there's always that thing, I don't know if you ever talk to your kids or, people, you know, there's this idea that people, some people are just lucky, they happen to be good at that or they happen to be successful, but talking to Daniel made me really think about this idea of choices. It's all about choices and it's about determination and perseverance. So, yeah, that's kind of a very, a very kind of sort of my personal perspective on all of this, but I'm really, really pleased to introduce Daniel too. So uh, Daniel's got a great story and I think you'll find it really thought provoking and, and helpful. That's the most important thing. Will it help you by the end of this 30 minutes? Will you be able to think about doing things in a different way? And I, I hope so, because I certainly have done. So Daniel, welcome. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, it's great to be here. I, I love when I'm asked to uh, share anecdotes from my sporting career. Uh, but before I do that, what I'd love to do is share with you what fast became my mantra. Three little things that I think uh, will stand you in good stead, whether you don a, a lycra vest and shorts on the track, or whether you put on a pinstripe suit and go to work. And they're simply this. Number one, understand that positivity really produces positivity. You'll get that whatever you send out there. Taking it a stage further, uh, it's great to have good people around you because oftentimes they'll see things in you you don't see in yourself. The second is that um, I've had many setbacks and I've had to appreciate that the setbacks will continue to occur. And when I fall over, pick myself up, dust myself off and crack on towards the objective. In other words, be resilient. And the final thing, uh, possibly the most important of all, and I think Dan alluded to it a moment ago, was that success really is a choice. I'm, I'm yet to uh, to meet anybody that wakes up in the morning and decides they want to be a failure, but everybody wants to be a success, but not everyone chooses to actually be one. Um, so what I'd like to do now, uh, I'd like to share one of the highlights of my career and kind of take you on a bit of a journey so you can see where it all started uh, to where it ended up. And hopefully you'll see along that journey how my mantra uh, became cemented within me. And uh, hopefully you'll take at least one of those things away from you today at the end of this very short session. Thanks, Daniel. I'm going to play the first video. A lot of British interest. 
Yes, plenty of British interest. Two Britons, two Americans, a Spaniard and a Jamaican will contest this final. Well, it should have been a Tunisian instead of a Spaniard. There is David Canal, and he's been promoted to this final. Tunisian finished in the first three places and was then disqualified. Labidi, the Tunisian, who was disqualified. There is Britain's Mark Hilton. Look comfortable, finished strongly. In the second semi final yesterday, 46 87 is time there. That is Milton Campbell of the United States. Daniel Keynes of Great Britain. So much expected of this young man. Still only 21 years of age, but he is the second fastest man in the world this year. A number of people fear that man, Danny McFarlane of Jamaica, who goes in the outside lane. Two silver medals for Great Britain so far. It's just the moment when Britain gets its first gold. James Davis, United States, lane one. David Canal, Spain, lane two. Mark Hilton, Great Britain in three. Milton Campbell, United States in four. Daniel Keynes of Great Britain in five. And Danny McFarlane of Jamaica in lane six. They do get away first time. Milton Campbell in lane four was slowly away. That situation accentuated because Daniel Keynes has gone off very quickly and has already cut down the stagger on Danny McFarlane. Mark Hilton has gone off conservatively in lane two, the tighter lane two. He will now have to kick to improve his position as they come to the bell. It's McFarlane and Keynes contesting it. It's Keynes who wins that particular battle. 21-41, faster than anything we saw yesterday. And it's Daniel Keynes who leads. Danny McFarlane of Jamaica in two. Milton Campbell in three. Mark Hilton in four. Keynes seems to be taking a breather down that back straight. He kicks into the final bend and he's going for home now as a young Briton. The law graduate from Swansea University. He's kicking for all he's got. Can he hold on? Milton Campbell coming on the wide outside, but he's not going to make it. It's Keynes who wins it. Campbell in second. McFarlane in third. 46-41. Each time, I watch that, each time I watch that race, he becomes closer and closer, but I assure you, I did win uh, by the smallest of margins, 0.04, and I became Britain's youngest ever world champion, tender age of 21, over the 400 metres. Uh, now, my story began under very different circumstances. I was born with a hole in my heart and spent the first few months of my life in an incubator. Uh, but clearly, I'm here telling you the story, so I made it through. But uh, I recall being born to a very sporty family. Both of my parents were both international athletes. My dad was part of the junior world record holding four by four relay team. My mother was the Commonwealth Games record holder for the 100 meter hurdles. It was interesting because going to school, I realized that being born to a sporty family wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Then my mom's brothers were both professional footballers. There was Gary and Keith Thompson who played in top flight football. Uh, Keith, the lesser known of the two, made his then Premiership debut when he was 17 years of age for Covent City and then played the rest of his football in Spain. And uh, Gary Thompson, uh, the more famous of the two, played at Aston Villa, QPR, Crystal Palace, Sheffield Wednesday. 22 years in top flight football, a couple of England caps, and then there was me. I was very small, quite scrawny, as per the video, not the biggest of people. Um, couldn't kick a ball straight. People would look at my parents at the school gate, see how big and strong they were see my uncles on match the day and sporting programs, look at me and be left with a multitude of questions. I couldn't quite understand what was happening. I could barely kick a ball straight. I was very slow. It just didn't make sense to people. Uh, now in the UK, they, there's a massive sporting tradition uh, known as a sports day for junior schools. And wherever you're tuning in from around the world, hoping that you guys have, have had the lovely experience that is sports day. But in the UK, there's also a tradition known as the parents race. Uh, now my parents would uh, take it in turns year on year to rock up to my school sports days uh, with one thing in mind, to destroy any parent who dared challenge them when it came to uh, the, the uh, parents race. So as you can imagine, my parents being international athletes, I would literally destroy everyone who came anywhere near them. So one year mother would turn up, she would win. The following year dad would turn up, he would win. And this became a Keynes family tradition. When I was nine years old, my dad went too far and really embarrassed me one year and turned up at school 
uh, in his Great Britain tracksuit. And uh, when the parents were called to race, he stripped down to his Lycra all in one. And I remember feeling really, really silly because not only did my dad look way better than me, uh, he got the, uh, the silverware, he won a medal, and uh, I, I barely made it onto the podium in any of my events. And uh, I banned him from coming to any of the uh, sporting events at my school. A band that I only lifted when I was 15 years of age at my secondary school, uh, and I'd somehow managed to make it into the sports day final of the 100 metres. Now, my secondary school had a massive sporting tradition. I was ready. I was prepared. And I thought, Dad, you can come. And true to form, my dad turned up to the stadium a few minutes late, just in time to see us being called to our 100 metre starts. And uh, our eyes locked, and he gave me a look that said, Son, now is your time to shine. Show me something. And uh, I felt really proud and thought, now's my time. I remember hitting my chest and getting into my blocks and firing out of the blocks and uh, finishing in fifth place, unfortunately, out of five. And I crossed the line feeling really dejected. I looked up and my dad's eyes and mine, we locked eyes again. And uh, I swear to this day, he looked away. I remember thinking to myself, this has to change. I cannot be put through this anymore. I'm done with sport. And I recall that very evening having tea in the family home uh, and there was a real atmosphere. My dad didn't know what to say or so I thought. I didn't know what to say, uh, but I had to say something. And I remember saying to him in the end that I'm done with sport. I cannot do this anymore. I am not going to continue in our family's great footsteps. I'm not going to continue the sporting tradition that everyone would like me to. I'm done. I'm out. And my dad's response to me has stayed with me to this very day. And he simply said, rather than, you know, labor the fact that I didn't train as hard as he wanted me to, rather than come up with some really philosophical answer, he simply said, I hear what you're saying, but have you crossed the T's and dotted the I's? He could see the confusion on my face, and so he proceeded to ask me a couple of questions, the first of which was, what time did you go to bed last night? Simple question um, that I didn't have the answer to because knowing full well I'd gone to bed in the early hours of the morning, my dad simply said, well, how many Olympians do you think would go to sleep the night before a major tournament in the early hours of the morning, wake up and expect to do themselves justice when they hadn't prepared? I kept quiet again and my dad asked me a second question. And that question was, and what did you have for breakfast this morning? Again, knowing full well that I'd woken up late, avoided the kitchen uh, in my haste to get to school on time and had missed breakfast. And he simply said, Dan, it's about time you were honest with yourself. Make a list of five things you should or could be doing better. Tell nobody about these things. And in a year's time, you and I will not be having this conversation. Of course. And I'd love to sit here and say that I followed this list for the right reasons. Uh, I made my list and followed it for the right reasons, but I really didn't. Uh, my sole motivation was to prove my dad wrong and get him to leave me alone. Uh, but a year later, nobody was more surprised than me. And having made my list and stuck to it properly, not only had I won sports day, and I found myself ranked in the top 10 in the country for my age group. And I couldn't believe what was happening. If you're anything like me, you almost have to see it to believe it, experience it, to really buy into it. I added another five things to my list. So now age 17, I've got 10 things on my list. And now I'm the fastest kid in the country, age 17. And I genuinely couldn't believe my luck. I assure you, luck had nothing to do with it. Let's play that back. Two years before, year 10 uh, at school, age 15, couldn't get into my school team, was reserved for the relay. And now age 17, I'm the fastest 17 in the whole country. Life is starting to look a whole lot different. I started to get into the Great Britain team and uh, things were starting to really move forward for me and I was starting to make a name for myself. And uh, unfortunately, what goes up must come down. And I remember going to America on a training camp and rather than returning virile and fit and good to go, I found myself in a real predicament. Uh, I returned home with several stress factors in my lower back. That summer, which was the summer of 1999, we spent the entire summer going from doctor to consultant, consultant to doctor, and they all said the same thing. Just as your career is about to take off, unfortunately, um, you brought to a halt. Unless you can have some surgery or some life-changing, life-altering uh, support, it's not going to happen for you. Um, we're really sorry. As you can imagine, after a summer of uh, misfortune and bad news, I returned to university that September, a very different individual. 
I used to apply for a sports bursary at the University of Swansea, but help me uh, with my training, with my equipment, with my travel. But this year I didn't bother. Why bother? Because I clearly couldn't run. There didn't seem any point in doing that. And the university, when I didn't apply, came to find out why. For the first time in a number of months, I heard a little bit of good news and there was a glimmer of hope. They saw my situation, saw my plight, and uh, said, come back to us. Let's put a little package around you and uh, we'll need you to make a choice in terms of which direction you go. And true to their word, they, they had two options for me. Option one was to have an operation. They would cut my lower back open and, uh, and fuse my lower lumbers back together again, put me in a cast and, and then allow the cast to settle down. And after three months, remove that cast and retrain me to walk and jog. After six months, jog and stride. After nine months, stride and sprint. And in a year's time, there would be a 50% chance that I could be the athlete in the world prior to my operation and injury. Option two would have been a really intensive core stability program, one that would make me not just six pack strong, but one that would make my girdle, my core so strong, to be able to withstand the rigors of running the 400 meters. They appreciated they had uh, given me a fair amount of information to digest, and they suggested I go away and speak to my parents or take counsel from someone that could advise me. But either way, whatever my choice was going to be, to come back sooner rather than later and get the wheels in motion on either program. So excitedly, I went back to my parents and said, Mom, Dad, we've got a choice to make. Uh, what shall we do? And uh, they, they quickly told me the choice had been mine. And in typical Kane's family uh, process, rather than say goodbye, they just put the phone down and left me listening to a dialing time, thinking what on earth I was going to do next. And as fate would have it, um, the year was 1999. It was September. It was a year before the Sydney Olympic Games. And the, on the television in front of me, an advert ended with, my then hero, a guy called Michael Johnson, who ran the 400 meters, the same event as me. And uh, for some reason, I just got it into my mind that I had to race Michael Johnson to be there to do that. My mind was made up, and I told the guys at the university the following day that I was going to take them up on their kind core stability opportunity or offer. And, uh, and the wheels were set in motion. And I'm happy to say that within four months, they had me back on the track. I couldn't run particularly quickly, but the fact I had no pain but was fantastic and anything over and above that I would take as a bonus now when I reflect on the reason I made that choice I actually feel as though I was completely out of order I had no business even thinking about the Olympic Games because at the time I hadn't run for a year when I had competed I'd only run 47 and a little bit of seconds which meant I was some way down the pecking order I was ranked 37th in the UK now when you consider there are only eight lanes on the track that meant I had no business even thinking about getting to the Olympic Games. Now, some of the guys in uh, the Great Britain team at the time uh, were all household names. Uh, Jamie Bolsh, Ewan Thomas, Mark Richardson. If I'd have met them, I'd have happily taken their autograph. Why was little old me who could barely um, even get onto the same track as these guys, even thinking about beating them because only three people would go to the Olympics? It just seemed rather foolhardy of me. But again, my mind was made up and where we go and it's interesting that a number of times I, i've spoken to people and they always say they they have these goals and these these visions but they've got no idea how they're going to bring them to fruition uh, and again it goes back to my mantra about you know making the right choices to be a success so fast forward to finishing university and uh, i always know it's always great to have good people around you because i recall seeing my mother outside the family home and uh, she essentially gave me an ultimatum an ultimatum that meant i had to train hard and within the six weeks before the Olympic trials, make the Olympic team. Um, and clearly, she wouldn't have thrown me out if I hadn't have, but she led me to believe she might just have done a little bit of tough love there. And over time, my time came down a little bit close to the elusive 45.8 Olympic qualifying time. By the time the Olympic trials had come around, I still hadn't quite made it. I'd run 46.3, half a second outside. There was still a way to go, but a valiant effort all the same. I made it through the heat and made it into the semi and somehow made the final of the Olympic trials, which meant I was in the final eight uh, of the UK best 400 meter runners vying for that spot on the Olympic team. And I thought maybe, just maybe, on your marks, get set, go. I flew out of the blocks around the top end in the 400 meters in the first 100, down the back straight, around the final curve. And to my surprise, I came into the home straight in front. I not believe what was happening. Uh, the favourite for the race was a guy called Mark Richardson, and uh, he looked at me as I uh, was running past him. 
I looked at him and for a moment, I think arrogance just filled my head. I looked at him and I winked and he winked back and ran straight past me. But in doing so, he dragged me along through a quick time. And then they announced my time. I'd run 45.79, one one hundredth of a second in the Olympic qualifying time. I was going to the Olympic Games. Three weeks later, I found myself leaving the UK from Heathrow Airport en route to the Sydney Olympic Games via the Gold Coast where the, the Golden Camp uh, was, was being held. Before we landed, um, the team manager at the time, he suggested we all prepare a few words because the media were waiting to interview us as we landed. I prepared a few words and nobody asked me anything. But it, I, it didn't deter me and I thought, you know what, they will once I've run. Um, five days before you compete, you fly into what's known as the Olympic Village, which is fantastic. Um, the, the, route, the, the, the rule of the Olympic Village was everything was free. Paid for nothing. It was fantastic. It was like a barracks home housing estate before the street names go up. Um, literally about two miles in radius. Um, canteen that was the size of a football pitch with every imaginable food. There were shops. Again, there was no currency. You just walked and were given you a quota and helped you stuff. It was fantastic. I arrived at the Olympic Village with one suitcase. I left with three. Even the suitcases were free. But all that good stuff aside, we were there to do what we could do for our country. And the night before you compete, you fly into the night before you compete, um, you have what's known as the Olympic lists, which uh, detail who's competing in your event, and they appear on screens around the village, plus online. And uh, if you can imagine online on the far left, it would have everyone's names in the column, uh, and the next column would have their season's best time, uh, followed by their personal best. And in the top right-hand corner, the number 45.8, because everyone there has to run the Olympic qualifying time. It was at that point I realized that my 45.79 wasn't quite as good a currency as I would have hoped for. I do what most people do when you start a list. I started at the top and I worked my way down to my my name, which was getting increasingly closer to the bottom. Now, of the 82 people in the men's 400, I found myself ranked 81st. And I'm not going to lie, my heart sank. I thought to myself, have I flown across the globe to be embarrassed on international? And the team manager at the time, a guy called Graham, took me aside for a pep talk. These are the exact words that Graham said to me. That Daniel, tomorrow is going to be your Olympic final. No, it wasn't. It was going to be the first round. And he continued and said, and you probably will get eliminated. But when it hasn't gone according to plan, and you are confronted by the world media, hold your head high, hold your chest forward, and tell them you've learned so much from the experience, and that you'll return in four years, bigger, stronger, and a lot faster. Good luck, son. And I thought to myself, if I felt bad before you spoke, how on earth do you think I feel now? And I got on the phone to my dad that very night. And uh, the words my dad said to me almost 23 and a half years ago have stayed with me to this very day. He simply said, listen, Daniel, tomorrow is going to be the biggest race of your career to date. And you've got a choice to make. Either you choose to go out there and be a success or you choose not to. I suggest you choose wisely. In true Joseph Kane's fashion, phone went down. There was no goodbye. There was no I love you, son. He simply left me there listening to a dialing tone. And for the first time, I didn't even mind because it clearly left me the very concise message, that being whatever you choose to do, choose wisely. The following morning, as fate would have it, I found myself en route to the Olympic Games. Now, for those of you that haven't been through an Olympic uh, process, if you're competing at 10 a.m., your preparation ends at 9. And then for the 50 minutes up until 10 to 10, you're going to be in a series of call rooms with the seven other people you're competing against. And then mm -hmm. 10 minutes before you compete at 9.50, you are produced into the stadium, gladiator style. And as you can imagine, making my debut for Great Britain on such an occasion, I was absolutely petrified. Now, if you're anything like me, I'm not proud of it, but sometimes I do lie to myself. I try to console myself with the fact that, don't worry, the first thing in the morning, there'll be nobody in the stadium, it's okay. I found out there was a sellout crowd, 124,000 people in the stadium. I continued to lie to myself and said, don't worry, uh, you're one of three people for Great Britain. They will be, uh, you, will, you won't go first, you'll see them run, they'll be fine, and then you'll be fine. And I found out I was in heat one, lane seven, I'll be the first person the Great British public would be. Absolutely petrified. And it's funny how time speeds up when there's something ahead of you you don't want to do. Before I knew it, I was onto the track been taken away the whistle uh was sound of the whistle went when the uh, starter was bringing us to our marks and then the stadium fell 
set. John went. I flew out of the blocks faster than usual this time, and I ran past the Polish guy in lane eight outside of me. And he gave me a look that said, "What on earth are you doing?" And all I could think was, "I have no idea." I ran past him down the back straight, and as a kid. I would often run around and scream for no reason, and I found myself doing the exact same thing until I came around the top bend and realized yet again I was in front. I thought to myself, are you tired? No, well, keep on going. What about now? Keep on going, keep on going. And the finish line was getting closer and closer and closer, and my friends told me that as the cameras panned in on me, I looked like an absolute nut job because I was having a full-blown conversation with myself through my international Olympic debut believe what was happening but across the line new personal best 45.39 i had qualified for the second round of the olympic games rather than me tell you what happened i think that's the stage watching and uh backley experienced his being around a lot unlike this young man who's done so so well qualifying for this stage of the 400 meters All right, they're getting ready for the final heat now, the men's 400 metres, and this Daniel Keynes goes for Great Britain. Only 21, a personal best in the first round, 45.39. He goes in lane number five. Cardenas of Mexico in one, Raquel of France in two, Perella Brazil in three, Mokanyeski of South Africa in four, Keynes Great Britain in five, Ismail of Qatar in six, Machkoviak of Poland in seven, Bada, Nigeria, in lane eight. The first four go to the semi-finals tomorrow, which will be shown at 11 o'clock UK time. Great moment for Daniel Keynes. they go and Keynes has gone off as he does very very quickly without any fear of the opposition at all he's closing down on Ismail who's been twice an Olympic uh, finalist Ismail I think he's a bit startled by the youngster being there has kicked in hard through 200 and at the moment it's Keynes possibly leading can he hold out coming off the bend they're beginning to close on the inside on him uh, but Keynes has the lead. This is a tremendous run by Keynes again. He likes to lead, and he's got a bit of a chance of qualifying. Coming through and just inside him is uh, the South African, and on the near side, the pole. But he's finished in third place and qualified for the semi-finals. I qualified again. To cut a long story short, I made the final finish last. Um, and we finished fourth in the relay, but then six months later, the video that I shared at the very beginning, that took place, the World Indoor Championship in Portugal. I won. Um, and it's an interesting one for me, because even looking back, I realised that in an 18-month period of time, I went from, gone from being unable to walk, needing crutches, uh, needing a walk, I thought I'd never be able to walk again, winning uh, the world title and becoming Britain's youngest ever world champion. And it's interesting that I think back and after marvel because uh my mantra really came in very very handy and i feel as though sometimes uh, if you can just remember that positivity really will produce positivity you can understand that setbacks are going to occur but you should never have a setback in so many outcome always choose to be a success you won't go far wrong um interestingly enough i'm often asked if i actually was as bad uh, at sports i may count when i tell my story and uh, we found a couple of videos um, from a fair few years ago, one in particular from 1992, that really shows the level that I was as a youngster when it came to sport. And if you could play that, that'd be fantastic. I remain to say that again. So uh, just to make life really easy, there are two black young men in that video. Um, I was not the one that came first. I was the guy 
that's no out of camera shot in lane eight. In fact, the guy that does win, the guy called Greg Kane, who share the same note, same surname, we have no relation at all. It's actually an English teacher now, fair play to him. Um, but if you're looking at that race, uh, if you're looking at that race in 1992, you had to pick one person from that race who would go on to become uh, an Olympian or in fact a world champion. I genuinely believe that nobody would pick me. I think one of the things that I take from that is where you start is where you start. Where you finish is entirely. I would I would usually go on and speak about the Commonwealth Games now. If it's okay with you, then I'll continue. I know we're out of time at this point, but I'm happy to continue. You can just let me know if that's okay. Yep, yeah, carry on. Fantastic. Um, it's interesting that uh, speakers tend to really focus on times when they go fantastic. So you've got that wonderful look at me. I'm fantastic. And if you recall, I won the. Uh, the world title by 0.04. Uh, the Commonwealth Games came to the UK in 2002 uh, in Manchester, and uh, little did I know that the event will be uh, be decided by the exact same margin, 0.04, the smallest, the smallest uh, of margins. Uh, now, for me, I'd just come off the track. I just finished semi-final. I won the fastest time of my career today, 44.9. I felt fantastic. This was my time to shine. Now, for any of the Manchester City fans that may be listening, uh, the Etihad played home or played host to the Commonwealth Games in Manchester 2002, and Port City right next door was the warm-up track where you, once you competed, you'd go there and you'd warm up or you'd warm down accordingly. And um, my dad handed me back my phone at the time with my coach. It was a Nokia 3210 taking it right the way back to the early noughties, made famous by the game Snake. Um, my phone at the time was was my pride and joy. It could hold a whopping 10 text messages, if you recall. And when number 11 would come through, an envelope would appear in the top right-hand corner. Um, it was a different time back then. And even my phone, and uh, I couldn't help notice the water that started to pour out of my face. My wife often tells me that I'm stone-hearted and don't ever see me cry. But on this occasion, Water started to stream out of my face. My dad couldn't handle me at the time, and he did what most men do when they can't handle their children. He uh, deferred to his my mother, his, his partner, and uh, when she couldn't handle me, she deferred to her mother. And uh, so nobody knew what to do with me. All they knew is that I was a bit of an emotional wreck. And to be fair, I was no help to myself. I always say it's good to have good people around you. My dad realised that sending me back to the Olympic Village or the, or the, the Athletes Village at the time would do me no favours. It would give my competitors an emotional lift, an emotional boost. And so he decided to take me out of the village, pop me into a new hotel where he would hand it to me and would try his best to bring me back to my previous self. It's always good to know yourself and know what makes you tick. And uh, anyone that knows me knows that I love to eat. I'm a massive foodie. I love to laugh, and so he got me one of my favourite meals, just steak, medium, uh, chips, peppercorn sauce, some natural sea salt, and uh, found some of my favourite comedians at the time, was a guy called Chris Rock, who I was quite fond of, and he uh, got me listening to Chris Rock and eating my favourite food, and before I knew it, I was brought back to myself. It's interesting when you cry and when you drain yourself the following day, um, you do feel lethargic, you do feel a little bit off, and uh, following that, I just felt a little bit off. Something wasn't quite right. The time ticked by, and before I knew it, I was en route back to the track to compete in the men's 400-meter final at Commonwealth Games. And as I did, as I got off the bus, when I wouldn't normally notice the the, the burger van, I noticed the burger van. The smell started to make me feel really nauseous. I wouldn't even notice people calling my name and what have you, but everyone that called my name suddenly got my attention. Something wasn't quite right this day, and it was almost like I wasn't in the zone. It had me draining myself the day before, crying and just, you know, using excess or emotional energy. Had that make a difference to my um, my psyche? Was that make that, that was making a difference to me? I was soon to find out. I went through the call room process, and before I knew it, I was brought up onto the track, and before I knew it, the gun had gone. I flew out of the block again and pulled back the Jamaican outside me in lane seven very quickly. And going down the back straight, all of a sudden my mind started to drift and noticed the English flags just all down the back straight, red and white crosses. And thought to myself, red and white, red and white. My kitchen would look fantastic painted red and white. Maybe at the right time to be thinking about kitchens. And going around the top bend, I realized the Jamaican that I'd overtaken 
had suddenly come back past me. And I marveled at the yellow kit and thought, the designer of this kit, it's terrible. And coming into the home straight, I realized that actually, you're in sixth place, you're about seven meters down. What are you doing? And I woke up, but would it be enough? Hill, Moncur, Francique, Millizar, Nimi, Kane, Blackwood and Brown. The Commonwealth men's four meters final. Check. Away they go. And as predicted, uh, Brown's gone quickly and so has Kane's. And Nimi's going. Kane's already up. I expected that. And uh, Francique is going very quick. He's gone past Millizar, but Millizar's a fast finish and going well. So is Nimi. And Kane's is in good position at the moment. And Moncur not getting form as they reach 200 metres. Brown still leading outside. Keynes is being run down by Nimi at the moment. And he's chasing Blackwood. Nimi can go well. Brown on the outside. And right on the inside is Francique. And Francique is running very strongly into the straight. And Brown on the outside. And Nimi. And here comes Blackwood. And Keynes has got an awful lot to do. And it's Francique on, Mon on the inside. And Moncur is coming through. And so is Blackwood on the near side. Who's going to get it? Blackwood! Is it Michael? You know when you haven't done enough and you know you haven't done enough and you've got no one to blame but yourself. I caught it into myself, 0.04, I won the World Cup. 0.04, what the Commonwealth Games look like. On your screen now, you'll probably see that uh, there's a photo finish. It's the exact photo finish that's been on the screen. My guy in yellow, uh, Michael Black of Jamaican, he uh, was the victor, 0.09. Uh, second place, Shane the Amy. Um, he was second in 45.11. Uh, third was where I thought I came, but they announced it as Arvid McCall, the guy in blue in lane one, 45.11. And fourth, me, is 45.13. It's absolutely good. I had none but myself to blame. And uh, it's funny how 0.04 had come back to haunt me. And it's interesting that for me, this is a real reminder, even right now, that the little things really do make all It took me back to my dad's message when I was 15 years of age, across the T's and got the eyes. And I fast forward back to me being 22. My daddy hadn't crossed the T's. I certainly hadn't followed my own mantra that has really stayed with me to this very day. Um, there was very little positivity. Um, step back was myself, and I certainly hadn't chosen to be a success on that occasion. So what I'll leave with you uh, this afternoon is, um, if you can, please keep my mantra close to heart because it can be positive. Understand that positivity really does produce positivity. Um, never let a setback determine the outcome. And finally, please choose to be a success because success is a choice you have to make, but not just today, literally. Thank you very much for listening to my story. Thank you, Daniel. That is a hell of a journey you just took us through there. I, my adrenaline was running uh, through that. Um, thank you so much. Hopefully, everyone gets a lot from that. It makes you realise that you know any little journey. Our journeys are probably a lot less significant, maybe, than that. But these, we're all trying to aim for a, some peak, but there's a bigger peak beyond. And you you talked us through that with great um, with great clarity and, and with emotion. Um, I think it's fair to say your, your point about positivity, managing through setbacks and making the choices is kind of echoed a little bit in this idea of no quick fixes. It's about determination, perseverance and self-discipline. And I think it's a, a great testament to your experience there, Daniel, what, what you came through with. Um, and I guess this kind of relates. We've all heard about the law of um, aggregation and marginal gains. This tells a lot about what you've described but i think it's very true in business too you know we've got to keep doing those incremental improvements day by day which result in the kind of achievements you want to get and um i this is a confucius saying i think you you uh basically uh you're an example of this <laughs> daniel you're very hard in yourself but i think maybe that's half the battle and uh this was a great quote by Henry Ford, which I think, again, is reflected in everything you've said. Whether you think you can or think you can't, you're probably right. It's all down to mindset. And I think that's really helpful, your, your conversation there. So thank you so much. Um, so you've given us a lot to be really positive about, a lot to motivate ourselves with. 
I'd like to thank you so much, Daniel. I know we're a little bit over, folks. It's 40 minutes, not 30, but it was really important to hear the heartfelt experiences of a double Olympian. So, uh, Daniel, thank you so much for your time. I hope you found it useful, everyone. And uh, if you've got any questions, pop me an email and I can uh, uh, discuss with Daniel. I'll get back to you. I have got one question, actually. Of all the questions that come through, there is one I really have to ask you, even though we're late, because cool. it's critical, right? It's, and the question is, how has your experience in Olympic athletics informed your working experience or your working habits? Yeah, fantastic. Um, I think as an athlete, <clears throat> an Olympian as well, um, I think it's about resilience. Uh, I, I genuinely believe that the discipline that track and field provides and sport provides means that whatever happens on Monday, uh, Tuesday is a different day. Tuesday, Wednesday is a different day. It allows you to continually pick yourself up. So, where you can't or don't know how to do something, it's important to find a way to learn how to. Never in a position that much. I'm sort of continually searching for knowledge for information um, to better myself. And my role now that I play in professional services. Well, thank you, Daniel. That is uh, with a bunch of other questions, but we are well over time. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, everyone, for spending your time with us. Uh, thank you, Daniel. We'll speak to you soon. And uh, that's been great. Thank you, everyone. Speak to you Cheers, soon. Cheers, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.